Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me in Moscow. Well, not really in Moscow, but kind of there. <laughs> uh, thank you for allowing me to connect from a remote and from distance. So let's get started. And um, today we are going to talk about Cerberus, which is a data validation tool I've been working on for a few years. Um, a few words about me. I am a software developer. I've been doing uh, software for many years now. I co-founded my company back in 1991, so it's been quite a wild ride and long ride. And yes, I do a lot of stuff, but what is more relevant for you is that I am also very active in the open source scene, both in Python and C Sharp and other languages. So Cerberus is a lightweight and extensible data validation library for Python. You can go to the website python-cerberus.org and find all the documentation. And most of the code samples we will see today, you can find them on the website. So you can kind of follow along as I keep going. It is, of course, open source. It has no dependencies. This was one of my first requirements when I started working on the on this project, I didn't want any dependency. And, what, and also I wanted something, something very lightweight, which would run on every version of Python. So we've been doing that since uh, the start, since the injection. And uh, you can find Cerberus on GitHub, of course. So why the name Cerberus? Cerberus, I found this very nice uh, quote from the Davis Dictionary by Ambrose Pierce. So Cerberus is defined as the watchdog of Hades, uh, whose duty is to guard, guard the entrance. Everybody sooner or later had to go there and nobody wanted to carry off the entrance. And that's very similar to what hmm, uh, happens with data validation. I mean, everybody has to do data validation at some point or another in their career. Uh, but yeah, is that kind of work that nobody really wants to do because it is boring, it is prone to errors, uh, and yet you still have to validate data as uh, they are coming in. Especially so if you are writing, uh, uh, excuse me, if you are working on, I don't know, a REST API or something like that, and you have data coming in from all kinds of sources, unknown clients, etc. You want to make sure that the data is sanitized before you store it on your backend. But before we dive into the Cerberus tool itself, I want to take a, a little diversion to uh, tell you this fact that I find really interesting. So this is um, the eREST API framework uh, on GitHub. As you can see, it has uh, about 6,000 GitHub stars. Now, mind you, why I'm mentioning Eve? Because Cerberus was actually born as a stepchild of the main project, which was the REST API framework. I needed something to validate the data coming into the framework and I started working on a data validation layer. And only a few months later, I decided to um, detach the data validation library uh, from the framework itself and release it as a, an open source project on its own. Because I, figu I figure most people will want to do data validation regardless of the REST API framework. So back to the GitHub stars uh, story. So here has been doing very well. It is very successful framework and it has a, a lot of stars. If we go and look at the Cerberus repository, it has a, a, a relatively low stars uh, uh, compared to Eve, just 2000. So not that many stars. And that might tell you that uh, Cerberus is not so successful compared to Eve itself, but uh, if we go and look at the data and the stats, we have quite a different story. Here is, uh, um, uh, this is these data are from, I think it's called the PyPyStats website. Uh, it's been available for a while. It didn't happen to be available for many years, but now we have the hard data. 
we can see on the left uh, the number of downloads that Eve is doing every single month. So it is a quite a high number. I'm really happy about it, 10,000 uh, downloads per month. But look at, at the download uh, of Cerberus. It's one million and more every single month, and it's been consistent for many months uh, right now. So like 100 better than Eve itself. So if there is one lesson from this talk, you should probably remember, regardless of not, uh, if you are interested in the, in the library itself, is, is that GitHub stars aren't really a good metric if you want to judge a project or see if the project is good for you, uh, if, if, if it is widely adopted or not. Yes, they are probably uh, an interesting indicator, but just make sure you don't decide based on the number of stars. There are some super cool projects on GitHub with a relatively low number of stars, uh, but still the adoption rate is probably much high, higher. You want to go at GitHub, uh, um, there is a graph on GitHub, I don't remember what the name is, where you can see how many uh, projects are dependent on, on uh, the project itself. Of course, that's not the worst story, again, because you don't see the uh, closed uh, project data there, but it is probably more relevant than, than the just the GitHub stars. All right, let's go ahead and look at Cerberus itself. So how does it work? You import a validator from the Cerberus library and then you define a schema as a dictionary. So here we see that we have a name field of type string and then we instantiate our validator. Then we submit a document to the validator. We call the validate method and uh, it will just return a boolean and tell you if the document is valid or it isn't. So just a boolean is not that much uh, useful, uh, but this is the full example. Here you see uh, the schema, we define the document, and then uh, we are validating the document against the schema. You probably want to know more, for example, why the document is not valid. Here we have a, a more complex schema where we have a name field, but also an age field, which is of type integer, or I should say must be of type integer, and it has a minimum value of 10. So the document we are passing is not valid because age is lower than that, and we get a false when we validate, but we can investigate the errors property to know what the problem is with the document. As you can see, the errors are actually into a list, so there may be more than one error per each field. What about unknown fields? By default, unknown fields are rejected. So here, the same schema, we have a name, and also we have a sex but the schema only knows about name and age. So this document is rejected because sex is an unknown field. This is the default behavior, but you can set allow, allow unknown to true. At, at that point, unknown fields will be allowed, as you can see in this example. Furthermore, you can decide that you want to allow, allow uh, unknown fields but you want to uh, be more strict, maybe, and uh, impose, uh, for example, a type on the unknown field. So here in this example, we are saying that we do allow uh, unknowns, but they have to be of type string. So the first document doesn't pass validation, while the second one, oh, uh, we don't have a second one actually here, <laughs> but <laughs> you see that there is an error, and the error is that the field must be a string type. You can also use a allow unknown in a nested mappings. This is an interesting schema. Here we have a document which has a sub document. The field is called edict. And you see that in this sub document, we allow unknown fields. 
So we override the default, default behavior just for the, uh, our sub-document. Here we have a full example. So we have uh, uh, this main document has a name, John, and uh, uh, oops, our dictionary has an unknown field which is allowed. But if we try to use an uh, unknown field in the main document, like here, this field here, but this, this will be rejected as we see here in the errors. We also have a validated method which returns validated document if it is valid. This is very useful. If, for example, this is a very common use case for servers. You have a list of documents, you want to validate them, but you want to be returned with a list of valid documents. So this is kind of a, a filter, you know. So here we are using a list comprehension and we are uh, submitting a list of documents and we are selecting only the valid documents and they are going to be returning in our list. So basically give me all the valid documents out of this probably huge list of documents. And since validated returns the document only if it is valid, it is very easy and convenient to do. Now, many times we also want to transform documents as we validate them. Now, validation and normalization are two totally different beasts. You normally don't want to mix and match them, but somehow Cerberus allows you to normalize your document. And it is in fact a different step from validation. So here you see that we have this normalized method so we have a schema where we have an amount field and a coerce rule. We will talk more about coerce in the following slides. So then we have a document with a, a, a field model and a field amount. Now look at this field. It has a string value here. It is a one, yes, but it is a string, not a number. If we get asked for a normalized document, because the rule is a coerce, which is a, a transformation rule, what we get back when we use the normalized method is a, a different type for that field. So amount is now an integer, has been transformed. Our normalized document, document has been transformed. Now, mind you, this is not validated, it is normalized. So if you validate the document, you still get a false because the document is not valid. But if you really want to transform a document, you can still use normalized and get your document normalized for you. Now, because we are in beautiful world of Python, we can do some tricks like, for example, you don't want to define your schemas with a dictionary. Maybe you want somebody who's not very proficient with Python uh, to be able to define the schema for you. You can do that, uh, for example, with YAML. Here we are defining a YAML. Uh, in this case, it, it is a string, it might be a file, and you load your schema from uh, YAML. You just have to import the YAML module, and then you go ahead and uh, validate your documents from uh, somebody else who defined the schema for you in YAML because he is more proficient with YAML and not with uh, Python itself. So let's give a quick look at validation rules uh, that Cerberus has uh, uh, by default. Let's see, let's just say that Cerberus comes with a number of validation rules, uh, predefined validation rules, and then we will see how we can expand on these uh, to um, suit our custom needs. So type checking, we already saw this. We can define a, a type for a field, and of course, server supports most uh, default types uh, which are supported by Python itself. What I find very interesting is that you can actually say that a field can um, be of different types. You just provide a list with a number of types, and so in this example, the quotes field can be a string, but can also be a list. And this is very useful for a quote field because as you can see here, the first document has just a single quote, but the second document has a number of quotes. 
provided as a list. Validation is valid for both. We can match against a regular expression. This is another very common use case. Here we are validating an email field. Super easy, you just set your regular expression and you're done. Frequently, you only want to allow for some valid uh, values. And this is done with the allowed rule. So here we have a, a role field of type list, but we only want to allow agent, client, and supplier as value for this list. So the first document here validates because we are uh, providing valid values, supported values, but the second document is not um, accepted, validated, because intern is not allowed. Sometimes you want a field to be allowed only if another field is present within the document. Uh, the, we call these uh, dependencies. So here, field two is not required, but when it is present, we also want field one to be pre present. So the first document only has field one and it is valid. The second document only has field two, it is not valid because Field two needs, has a dependency, so to speak, on field one. So it is rejected. Field one is required. But sometimes you want to be more strict. For example, you, you not only want field one to be there, but you also want field one to have a certain value or one or more values. So you, what do you do? You just provide the dependencies rule with a list of valid values for the field one. So again, the first document here has field two and it is valid because field one because field one is there and the valid and the value for field one is valid. The second one is rejected because three is not allowed for field one. And then we have the contrary. Sometimes you want a field to be present only if a second field is not there. So we can use the exclude rule. And here we see that uh, the first field excludes the presence of a second field and, and vice versa. So here, first field is present, second field is present, false. We don't validate this document. While we, we validate the second and the third example here, because uh, again, the two fields are exclusive. Now take a look at the last example here. The document is empty and it is still valid because the two fields exclude each other, but they are not required. Sometimes you want an exclusive or. So we want first field, we want second field, they must be alone, but we don't want an end. We want one of them to be always there. We don't accept, a, we don't want to accept a, 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 an empty field. So the way you do that is super simple. You just set a required rule for both fields, as you can see here, and you still exclude the other field. So this is more a combination of two rules, exclude and required. And you can also, of course, exclude multiple, file, multiple fields. You just provide a list of, five, of fields, sorry, you want to exclude. Um, what about sub document? This is very common. You have a main document, an invoice, for example, and then you have a, a sub document, which is a row. So you can define a schema for the sub document, and that one will be validated as well. Here we have a field which is called edict, and then we have a sub document which is an address, and uh, we we can validate that. We can also accept a list of uh, sub documents, which is the example I was mentioning before. Uh, so imagine uh, in this case, a, a list field and uh, all the fields must be of type integer. This is probably very common. And in this case, we still have a list, but the items within the list, the list are uh, sub documents that says dictionaries. 
So we can say the rows for our document, they must be of a type dictionary and what the first field must be a string, the second field must be, must be an integer, etc. So imagine an invoice uh, with a rows uh, array and every document within the array needs to be validated as well. You can do that very easily. Then we have some, uh, I call them magic methods. So for example, here we have any of, but you also have all of, none of, and one of. They are all work uh, pretty much in the same way. So here we have a number and this number has a number of views that needs to be applied on it, but just one of them must be valid and we can accept the document. So here we have uh, uh, any of, uh, a range of uh, values, allowed values. So we have this number must be between zero and 10 or between 100 and 110. So in the first case here, uh, five is valid because it, it is within the first range and 105 is still valid because it is within the second range. In this case, 55 is not allowed because it is outside of all these two ranges and we have applied an any of rule. Now, why call these magic methods? Because actually you can shortcut uh, most rules and apply this uh, uh, magic method to, for example, a type rule. So here we are saying that the full fields can be any of these types, string or integer, which is roughly equivalent to the stuff you see here, which is way more verbose, I guess you will agree with me. And why this is powerful? Because for example, you can uh, scale up and use this magic method on schema themselves. Here we are defining two schemas for the department field, as you can see, and this, this is a list of schemas. So every document, every dictionary here is a schema, validation schema. In the first example, we have uh, uh, a required field and a regular expression and the phone is nullable. In the second case, we still have the department field, which is required, but does not have any rejection, re regular expression, sorry, and the phone is required. And here we are building a validator where one of the schemas must be valid. And the type, of course, of this uh, uh, field is still a dictionary. And we also allow unknown. So here we have uh, another filter, kind of a filter, where we want to uh, find all the invalid employees, or I should say, the, all the invalid phones for the employees. So we uh, loop, we pass a list of, of employees, and for every employee, we get back the invalid document. But because we are validating against different schemas, we can be very flexible uh, in our validation. For example, here it is probably the same example, but this time we are applying the one-off schema. So either the first or the second of the schema, or the schemas must be varied. There are many more rules, we don't have the time, and probably you are also not very interested in seeing all of them. These that you see in this list are very simple, required, nullable, forbidden, read-only, empty, et cetera, et cetera. Mean and max, you can check on the length, et cetera. You can look at the documentation if you want to learn more about that. So let's move on and see and talk uh, about the schema registries. Uh, here you see uh, the use of a schema registry. You, it is basically a registry where you can def uh, add schemas. Here we, have, we are defining um, a registry with a key user, and this is the, the, the schema for uh, which we are going to store as a user. And then when we define a schema, we can uh, define a field and just say, apply the user, as you can see here, schema, and uh, you can reuse it. 
Now, this is very nice when you are, your validation rule set starts to grow. You have many rules and defining the rules for your documents might become really cumbersome. So the trick here is to uh, involve the schema registry, add the rules to the registry, or I should say the schemas to the registry, and then recycle the, the, the schemas uh, via the registry. This will really make your schema definition uh, more readable and simple to manage. And we also have, of course, a reuse uh, registry. We call it a reuse set registry. In this example, uh, we define a shortcut basically for uh, the Boolean uh, rule. Normally, you would go and define full of type boolean but you can just uh, shortcut to boolean and every time you use boolean we use you are saying that you want a document uh, uh, sorry a field to be of type boolean and booleans here is a plural and this is for uh, documents uh, uh, for schemas sorry we want to allow for again here you can see that we are already using the boolean shortcut within the real set registry itself so in the value schema, we accept the Boolean value of types. And talking about normalization, we have some tricks there as well. For example, we allow for field of renaming. Here we have a document with a single field, but our uh, validator has a rename rule for the full field. So here we are acting on the field itself, on the key and not on the value. Every time we get a document within uh, uh, our normalized method with a full field, we rename that field to bar, as you see here. But many times you want to be more powerful. For example, here we have the allow a noun rule and we, provide a custom handler, a custom renamer. And we want to apply this transformation. We want to transform the key to an integer. So in this example, we have a string. We transform it to an integer, as you can see here. Of course, your rename handler can do and perform whatever operation you want on the name of the field. More so, you can have a pipeline. For example, here we have a function which returns only even digits. And our rename handler is defined as a pipeline. You see, we are using a list. When we do this, the transformation will be applied in sequence, starting from the last side of the, of the list down to the last one. So we first apply string and then we apply our lambda here. Again, let's look at this document. This, uh, this document has a numeric key. We transform it to a string and then we transform it to an even digit. Another very useful rule is to purge or purge <laughs> unknown fields. So we might allow or not allow fields that we do not know. Sometimes we just want to get rid of them. This is very common. So in this validator allows for a field string, sorry, for a full string, and also wants to get rid of all the unknown fields. So when we use the normalized on this one, you see the bar fields is unknown and the return document does not have that field. So we can just use servers to clean up documents and normalize them, standardize them. We can also set default values for some fields. For example, here the kind field is a string and has a default value. And when we pass a document without that field, it will get the default value if it is there, but it has a non value, still gets a default value. If it has a value, of course, it doesn't get a default value. And even more, 
than that, we can have a default setter again. So here we are setting a lambda for our unknown field. I'm sorry, for our B field. So our input document has no B field and it will be set to our um, lambda. So here we are, look at this, we are getting the, when we, we use a lambda here, we get the document itself as input. So we take the key for the R fields, sorry, the value for the R fields and add one to that. And that is, it, and that is going to be the value for the B fields. So transformation based on the value, on the other uh, document, uh, on the other uh, values uh, for the document, on the context of the document. And here we have value coercion. So we are transforming a field. We already saw this in, the, in one of the first examples. The flag type uh, uh, Boolean, and we want to actually force coercion to a Boolean. So if we have, like here, a true, which is actually a string, not a, a real Boolean, we can just transform it to a Boolean. Let's talk about extension now. We can build custom views. For example, here we are defining a rule which is going to uh, validate a document and make sure that the values are odd. The way we do that is that uh, subclass, uh, we just subclass the base validator class in our own class, and then we define a new validation rule. Underscore validate, underscore name of the rule here is odd. We apply our own logic within the method, and then we can start instance our custom validator, and in this case, amount with a value of 10 is not valid because amount must be an odd number. So our rule here is functioning. We can build custom data types. Here, an object ID is validated. It, it becomes a valid type and we can validate it again our documents and make sure that the ID field in this example is actually a valid um, object ID. Now, mind you, this example here is a little uh, obsolete right now. In uh, the newest version of Cerberus, there is a much easier way to do this. Uh, we actually have uh, a type register where you can register new types, very much like we did uh, uh, before with the schemas and the validation views. So go and look at the document. You will find, you will find a better way to uh, add uh, valid uh, types to your validation views. And of course, the, the, the queen of all of our, uh, uh, extensibilities, uh, and this is the, the option to add uh, um, uh, your own validator to a field. This is probably needed if you need some more advanced validation. Here we are defining our a function, and then we attach the function as a validator to the amount field. So here we are again uh, still checking if it is an odd number, but we are using a custom uh, method uh, which we have attached to the field. And the same thing you can do with coercion. This is a complex example, an advanced example where we have uh, our own uh, validator, a subclass of the custom or the base validator. You see it as a, a constructor, it takes a multiplier. Here you see the usage of this one. Basically, we are normalizing, multiplying the values of the documents by two, as in this, the document has a full value of two, because we are multiplying by two, the new values is four, just an example of course. Of course. And here you see the schema where uh, uh, we have defined a new multiplier rule. So every time a full field comes in, it will, it will be transformed and multiplied by a factor of two because we use a two in the constructor. This is just an example of how flexible your validator can be. And again, you can set default setters. Here we have a date, which is of course a date time value, but we have, we also set a default setter. We want all our date field when they are missing to be of UTC uh, default value. It is super simple to do. 
In this example here, we see how we can use uh, Cerberus to validate objects and not just dictionary. This is very easy to do in, uh, in um, Python because we all know that classes in Python are actually using a dictionary to store the property values. So you just have to reach for the uh, Dunder dictionary within the class and validate that one. This is a very su super simple example. So we are building a object validator with a schema, and then we pass a person instance to the validate, validate object method, which we uh, defined here in our subclass. And we can pass a person and know if the person is valid or not. So you don't only use Cerberus to validate uh, dictionaries. You can extend your classes and your validator to validate so much, uh, so many things. We have an extendable API. You can go to the documentation and look at error handlers, validation error extension, error list, etc. I'm not going to waste a lot of time here. Just know that you can go and find a rich documentation about the API uh, that Cerberus itself is using. Uh, this is a testimonial that we had many in the past. This is one of the uh, I probably like the, be the best. Uh, they are using several uh, Git Prime. Uh, Vincent Dreesen here is the author. You, you might know Vincent because he is famous for the Git flow workflow. He is the original um, author of the Git flow uh, post on his own website, and he's been serving as a CTO at Git Prime for quite a while. Uh, just a few words for the development team. Right now, I am the author of the project, but the, the, and also the maintainer. But the main maintainer right now is Frank uh, Funky Future, and I can't really pronounce his uh, <laughs> his uh, surname. But yeah, uh, Frank has been working really hard on the version uh, two of Cerberus, which is about to be released, and it will. Uh, Carry many new features, uh, and uh, most of them are uh, the result of uh, Frank's work. So, a big shout out for Frank, who has been uh, kind of carrying the flag in the last month on, on Cerberus project. We also have more than 50 contributors to the project, and my invitation, if you like the project, is to join us and help uh, me and Frank on on the project with a. Uh, tickets, new tickets and contributions, uh, et cetera. We are very open uh, to new contributors to join the, the development team. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, if you have any question, I guess we probably have uh, a QA session right now. And if, anyway, you here you can find all my um, references. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm very active on Twitter. But you can also send me an email or just go to the Cerberus website and you will find all the, the information you need. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Nicola. It was really nice to hear this extensive overview of Cerberus. And I never actually thought that it's capable of such many things. Uh, we <laughs> will now transform to a Q&A session. We just need to a minute to catch up the synchronization between the translation and uh, the Zoom session. Okay. Итак, мы прослушали доклад, и сейчас переходим в часть Q&A. Напоминаю, что вам нужно в Zoom поднимать руку, чтобы технический модератор заметил вас и включил ваш вопрос. Не забывайте, что вам нужно останавливать трансляцию, когда вы будете говорить, потому что иначе вот это вот запаздывание будет создавать большие проблемы в прослушивании. Ну и да, опять же, если вы сомневаетесь в своем английском, то задавайте вопрос по-русски, мы его переведем и переведем ответ. Вот. Что там еще? Есть вроде вопрос, поэтому ждем, когда его выведут. Я также напоминаю, что у нас есть восхитительные ребята, которые помогают нам сделать это первую в мире конференцию, в первую, в мире, в первую в России IT-конференцию, и мы вот очень благодарны э, нашему особенно генеральному онлайн-партнеру Тинькофф. Э, так, пока я 
не успел зачитать всех остальных партнеров, у нас подключился э, вопрос слово на, от Паши. Так, э, вперед. Um, hello, thank you very much for talk. I have a quick question about validation and uh, exactly about um, best practices and validation, I think. So say I have some API which accepts some object. For example, it can be person with, you know, like ID, name and age. But sometimes when I first time when I'm first time creating this person, I don't have its ID. And when I want to update it, I have its ID and I pass this ID along with the name or age uh, which should be updated. What is the correct way to handle this situation of different validation for the same object? Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, if I get your question correctly, one option you have, with, at least with Cerberus, is to define a couple of schemas. We saw an example where uh, uh, I was defining two schemas and why um, I was using, I think, the any of rule. So basically, you can accept both a person without an ID and a person with an ID. Uh, so validation won't fail in either cases, mm -hmm. if that's what you want. Or you can uh, switch to uh, a one-off option if you are in the situation where you don't want to accept uh, uh, the ID field, for example, because you are accepting a person for the first right. And in that case, you don't want the ID field to be there. You just uh, use the one-off rules, uh, or you just define one schema. And then when you are updating the, the person, you, you um, invoke the validator with the alternative schema. So you basically have a full uh, control and uh, all available options. You just have to decide which schema you want to validate against, or you can validate against both of them at the same time, if that uh, uh, suits your use case, of course. Okay. Uh... У нас есть следующий вопрос, да? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, this is like a really, really You're interesting welcome. library to look at. Uh, thanks. So my my question is uh, usually like when when thinking about validation, I I would probably like first things that come to my mind are uh, especially with REST APIs are like open API. Uh, the same like a swagger and and also JSON schema. So yeah. uh, I yeah. think of like from what I saw, you are uh, somewhat like compatible with, with those. So, or like, is there any way to like convert a schema from one format to another, or you can just you know load the JSON schema and so on? So I, I would like to know a little bit more about that, please. Yeah. So thank you for this question. I get this very often. So often, in fact, that. I want to show you uh, our repository. <clears throat> I guess you are seeing my screen on still, right? Yep. All right. So a while ago, I opened this ticket here. Yeah, if you can just make it that a little was bit the... uh, larger, the font. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just could you, could you zoom in a little bit, please? Can you see it now? Yeah. Readable? It's better, yes. All right. Yeah. So this dates back in 2016, and uh, there is a story about JSON schema because uh, I'm telling it here in this ticket. So you can go and check ticket 254. Uh, basically, the, the point is that when I started working on EVA and on data validation, uh, the JSON schema um, specification was already available, but there was no library for Python back then. Uh, also, I wasn't really happy with the specification back then because it was very uh, limited compared to what Eve and my REST API needed to do. So when I started working on Cerberus, uh, the JSON schema library for Python didn't exist. So I opened this ticket in, the, in 2016 just to ask to the users, to the adopters of Cerberus, what do you find 
uh, in um, difference between Cerberus and Jesus schema and what are the advantages and disadvantages of one of one package compared to another and over time many people have been uh, answering it some have been doing some performance comparisons here the second response you see here is from Fatty Future who is the main maintainer right now uh, for example, this guy here went into observation about OpenAPI, etc., because he's been using OpenAPI in his own projects. And so, you, and my advice here is that you go and give a read to this um, ticket because you will find a lot of examples and uh, you know pros and cons. And also, someone has been working on transforming uh, or making Cerberus validation compatible with OpenAPI. Uh, I think there is actually a project on uh, GitHub, I'm not sure where, uh, which does it precisely that. So you can, uh, my advice is just go and go up there and uh, check out the ticket and you find all the answers you need and probably more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, I think we have to... one more question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh... Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Hello. Um, Hello. I wanted to ask you if you uh, explore, explored the idea of type annotations for validation and uh, if you heard of a uh, Pydentic project which uh, uses uh, Python type annotations for schema validation. So like you can pass a dictionary to a model, which you define as a class with type annotations. And uh, what's, what's the idea? Uh, the the and uh, uh, difference between uh, your project and uh, by Dantic. I'm not really sure I got your question. So you're asking if I consider the option of using annotations or supporting uh, annotations? Yes. I, okay. So the first question, uh, did you explore the option of type annotations uh, mm -hmm. as a source of uh, schema? And uh, No, I, I didn't. I actually, uh, I don't think we, Ever had a, a request about this, so I, I never really thought about it. But it looks like an interesting idea. You might want to uh, suggest it or just open a ticket, and we can give a look at it, explore the option with Frank probably, and see it can fit mm -hmm. in uh, for a version two of Cerberus, which is uh, going to be released this year. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, well, I guess I, I'll have a short follow up on the last question is that if you add type annotation, then it will have to abandon the support of Python 2, I guess. And uh, yeah, is that on your roadmap uh, in the future or you will? Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I suspect that with version 2, we will drop version 2. Of Python support uh -huh. uh, and just uh, use uh, Python 3. Uh, Python 2 has been kind of an hindrance lately. Uh, uh, Frank has been wanting to drop the support of, for Python 2 in version 1 already, but we've been uh, going strong just because so many people are using it on Python 2. But now that uh, Python 2 is officially out of the question, you know, it's not supported anymore. We feel way more confident in uh, dropping uh, support for it. Also, because you can still use uh, the old version of Cerberus version one point uh, X, which is uh, already a very powerful. Uh, and I mean, um, you can do whatever you want with that. If you're um, kind of forced to use Python two, you can still use Cerberus. But for version two, the story is go probably is going to be Python three. Okay, good to know that you follow the uh, the herd, <laughs> so to say. Yeah, we we've just been waiting for the uh, official uh, dropout of several. Yeah, I see. 
of okay. Python too. Um, when I used uh, Cerberus, or when I was comparing different validation libraries like a Truffaret, Marshmallow, uh, the JSON schema one, and Cerberus, I can't help but notice that the documentation of Cerberus is really great. So you, it looks like you have a lot of um, uh, love for the properly d documenting this. Can you share if that's like a part of your vision or is it just happened to be that way? Because I think that's the similar case with Python Eve that it's very well documented and it's very beginner friendly and just uh, really great that you care about this part. So is that something you developed over time or you just uh, like happened automatically? Uh, this is a very good question, thank you. <laughs> Uh, actually, I put a lot of effort in uh, writing documentation, and also because uh, English is not my, um, as you can tell, is not my uh, native language, it really takes uh, a lot of effort. But back at the time when I, I um, released Eva, I was really, uh, I was always convinced that it could only be adopted if I documented it really well. There is a story about Eve, we don't have time now, but actually Eve was kind of an afterthought after I gave a talk at EuroPython back into, I think it was 2012. Back then I gave a talk about how to make REST APIs with Flask, and then people came to me after the talk and said, hey, because don't you release your framework for the open source? So the framework was ready, but there was no documentation for it. And then I went and spent maybe one month just writing documentation. It was full of errors, by the way, typos uh, and grammar errors, all kind of uh, horrors. But the community really helped me there because they got the idea and then uh, helped me with correcting the errors and the typos uh, and the grammars, etc. So with Cerberus, it's been kind of a um, continuing on the tradition uh, of uh, trying to do, to do my best in the documentation. I find that documentation is really key to any open source project. There is one guy in the EVE repository. He, he is not a developer or probably not a very experienced developer, but a few, few years ago, he submitted a pull request with so many corrections on the documentation and doc strings, typos, etc. I still value that contribution uh, like it was some kind of new super cool core refactoring. Because yes, really, documentation is the you know the, the business card of the open source project. So it is it is it is really has a, a place in my heart. Great to hear. Uh, that's really nice. I, I think a lot of people who want to contribute to open source often overlook this, that they can just uh, take a Absolutely. framework, just figure out how it works and just submit documentation because that's usually not the first thing you do as a developer of some open source tool. And it's a really easy contribution that makes everyone's life easier. Okay, so I think we have yeah. one other question. Yep. Hello, uh, my name is Vladimir. Thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, let me continue the topic. Uh, I got a pretty simple question. Uh, how do you find the uh, time to contribute to open source projects? <laughs> uh, that's uh, another good question. Actually, right now, I'm super happy that Frank has kind of taken over on maintaining Cerberus. I wish there was somebody like Frank for Eva itself, because, uh, yes, he has been really taking a lot of time in the last years. It's like eight years now that I'm working on the framework. And uh, now it is kind of stable, so I, it doesn't require me as much time as it used to do back at uh, the time. But it is still, uh, yes, very demanding. Uh, now, uh, when it was released and Cerberus with it, uh, uh, it was kind of a uh, key for our company, for my own company. So it was, uh, you know, just work. 
work done with a passion. Otherwise, I wouldn't release it as uh, open source, of course, because just writing documentation was a, a lot of effort uh, and, you know, defining the API. I find that when you uh, work uh, with the um, idea that people all over the world might adopt your project and start using it, you are kind of forced to uh, do the best you can because people are going to look at your code <laughs> and they kind of judge, judge your work and uh, you know it's kind of uh, yeah it, it gives, it, the pressure is high but it is beneficial I find that it really helped me improve my skills uh, as a developer as a professional so the time I invest in open source projects is actually it has a very good return on the investment. The developer I am today, eight years after the EVO release, is, uh, I think, uh, much more skilled and experienced uh, than what I would have been without my adventure in open source. Okay. And yeah. so my, uh, my message is, uh, you don't, you don't have to release an open source framework. You can just contribute to assist the open source project. Just do that because just doing the, just, just the act of going and figure out how to submit a pull request to a project is going to do a lot of well things to your future self. Great. Uh, thank you. It was really an inspiring talk and uh, even more inspiring questions uh, sessions. I remind that we have a discussion zone, so uh, there will be a few people, I guess, wanting to continue to talk. And uh, uh, yeah, so thanks for your talk and your time, and please stick around for the discussion. Uh, Unas? Yeah, hello. Yeah, sorry, I'm back. So guys, do you have like any, any more questions for Nicola about, about anything you want to discuss? I, I was, uh, I'm actually interested. So we, we ended on a really positive note about uh, how to be like, uh, how to do open source basically, right? So uh, my question is, um, have you ever tried, maybe considered organizing different kinds of, I don't know, hackathons for people? So to, to do like a code sprint where they can pick up some low hanging fruits or uh, just fix some long, long-term problem that that's been there for for some time so did you ever have something like that yes actually i'm running a kind of a local co developer community here in my hometown uh, it's called the romania and uh, when um, in uh, in this community what we do is uh, meetups so we meet we just just yesterday evening we had a meetup about uh, graph uh, uh, databases, for example, but sometimes we just meet it to do some uh, hackathons, and we have been doing hackathons on Cerberus, but also on uh, you know different languages and stacks, uh, all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. So I really like doing that. I'm also actually uh, the organizer of the uh, local Coder Dojo, and I don't know if you know about Coder Dojo. So these are kind of coding clubs for kids. Mm -hmm. So we teach kids to. Uh, do some basic programming. We use stuff like, um, mm, what's the name of that project? Uh, um, oh, now I don't remember the name of the project, but it is basically something that came out of the MIT. And it is uh, just a project which uh, uh, uses cartoons and stuff like that, and blocks like Legos. Uh, to build uh, uh, flowcharts uh, and the kids use them to program uh, animations uh, on their screens, stuff like that. So something so like really, Scratch, uh, I think, right? Yeah, Scratch, that's Scratch. the name. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the name. <laughs> that's one of the tools we've been using. Mm -hmm. And so I like to do hackathons with kids, actually. <laughs> it's like uh, five or six of us, uh, which um, uh, we are kind of mentors for them. We meet once a month and we try to um, uh, you know, inspire them to do uh, some, um, use the computer for something else than playing or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, using uh, Twitter or uh, Facebook or whatever they use these days, Instagram, etc. We try to inspire them and see, show them that they can be creative on, the comp on a computer 
by doing something, uh, by building something with a computer, mm -hmm. actually. And the message there is uh, uh, being a nerd is actually cool. You are not uh, some uh, introvert person or some or stuff like that. You can be cool and uh, using a computer and we try to show them how to do that. So yeah, I love doing hackathons with adults and with mm -hmm. kids. And, and do, you, do you have like any kinds of you know, calendar where uh, some guys can also register and participate? Because I, I, uh, I recently read about several several similar events happening like all over the world basically and now they're getting more and more active because everybody's sitting at home and they're like eager to find something to get busy <laughs> so, and yeah, that, yeah, that's absolutely. yeah that, that's a so good yeah we do we do have a calendar uh now the local community is actually an italian community so you probably wouldn't have a lot of, of fun <laughs> i think with us but yes, we do have a calendar. And actually, now that you mention uh, uh, the current situation here in Italy, as you can imagine, is really, we are really, really living a dire situation right now. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of issues with the COVID-19 virus. So people are uh, closed in their homes. And yesterday evening, we had our first online meeting, actually, of, mm -hmm. uh, for our uh, meetup. We usually just meet in some... Uh, uh, place like a library or uh, something like that but yesterday was our first online meeting and what I found uh, very interesting in that uh, we had like a, a, uh, maybe double the presence that we usually have when we meet in person we have like uh, 60 people I think yesterday evening online mm -hmm. and some of them were actually coming from uh, all around the country. So from Turin, while we are uh, on the east side of Italy, they, uh, this guy was coming in from the western side of Italy. So being online is actually empowering somehow. I mean, I really don't, I, I really prefer the personal uh, meeting. Uh, for example, when we do our meetings, we don't do streaming, we don't, do, we don't record our session because we want people to actually get out of their homes and join us in person because you see i find that uh, in our uh, industry especially in our industry we really need to um, get out of this um, uh, stereotype that uh, a programmer is somebody closed in his own room a living room or, or a bedroom just hacking a code night and day and not seeing the, the, the sunlight we, I actually want to tell people, hey, you're cool. You, you can get out, have fun with other programmers. We can have parties, so we can do smart things. We can, we can go by the pool and stuff like that, like all the other people. Uh, and so I try to encourage people to meet in person. But th with that being said, I, uh, I'm learning that going online uh, is, actually has a lot of advantages. For example, you can gather way more people from uh, uh, not only from your hometown, but from everywhere in the world. So we are now considering uh, doing uh, in-person meetings and meetups, but also online meetings and meetups. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. I went, uh, I think, I don't know, just uh, pro probably Italians are pretty good with English, right? <laughs> yeah, well, so judging by uh, you. <laughs> no, no, actually, I'm not really good in English. I, I kind of learned, this is one of, of the other advantages, advantages of uh, going open source. Before starting with EVE and the open source uh, EVE, uh, open source release of EVE, I wasn't really that good in, uh, at least in speaking and listening in English. I mean, I've been reading English since I was a kid, because when I was uh, like uh, 14, I started using a Commodore 64 back then and the Spectrum they ZX, something like that. And yes, I, so I was buying, uh, uh, you know, US magazines because here in Italy, we didn't have anything about, I mean, there wasn't internet back then. We are talking the mid eighties <laughs> of last century. <laughs> so it's been quite a while. And back then uh, I could read English very well, but I couldn't speak it. And I couldn't understand anything by if someone was speaking English. And the first time I went and uh, presented to an international conference was actually back in 2012, so not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I was mentioning it before during my talk, uh, the QA session. I went there and did a 90 minute uh, session on uh, doing REST APIs with Flask. And people didn't realize, but that was my first time ever speaking English to a public. It was very scary. And if I go back and think about that thing was probably the most uh, dangerous thing I've done in my life. <laughs> it's really stressful and important to me, very pivotal. And so I started improving my English only uh, in the last maybe 10 years or so. But um, in, unfortunately in Italy, not everyone can speak English super well, but yeah, the average people uh, do their best. <laughs> but it's not really a high level of English here in Italy uh, on, on general. Mm -hmm. But, but on, on your meetings, you usually speak Italian, I suppose. Yeah, when we meet here in our hometown, we do speak Italian. Mm -hmm. And uh, also because you see, we are talking with people who like to kids mm -hmm. and uh, we do try, we do use Italian there, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah, I was also like participating in the conference about like two days ago, it was like my first online conference and it was like, really, really a kind of new experience, especially with, yeah. uh, also, also with English. So <laughs> you speak English very well, so you wouldn't have <laughs> okay. any issue or problem in, uh, in participating to any conference in the world, probably. <laughs> so are there any, any other questions? I see some, there are, there are some other guys here. Maybe you want to say something or you, you can, you can say it in Russian. I can translate. There's something in the chat, probably. Yeah, I see. Mike, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Oh, he, he muted back. Okay. Anton, you're, I think you're also unmuted. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> Just listening. I uh, connected. 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Sorry. So you Just my talk. Your questions about English, about you. Yeah, so let, let me uh, one, once again, I, I mean, after, after some time, if we don't have, uh, if we run out of ideas for discussion, I guess we can switch to Discord. But uh, let yes. me ping people there once again. So maybe, maybe they want to talk about something. I also uh, I also saw like oh, there is there is this format uh, which is kind of on like online school uh, but it's not uh, it's not really for kids it's also like for adults and for people who already know the basics of programming but they just want to you know drastically improve on that yeah. uh, there is this format with uh, uh, I, I remember uh, it's called like uh, records school or something mm -hmm. it's uh, there's one in new york where you need mm -hmm. to like go through a test and then there is like an intensive week uh, you should yeah. dedicate talking to people like one-on-one -on -one and learning new technologies that you like put in your in your survey that you want to learn uh, yeah. some new programming language or low level stuff so very very awesome. cool yeah i think they are free actually there is one uh, one uh, school of this kind i read about it uh, in new york and also in paris i believe they are, there is some kind of foundation behind them and they are i think they are they might be free actually and they, that's a very interesting project but i think there is some millionaire behind that uh, who is providing the funds for the for the school to to be to, to work and so that makes sense i mean you you need money in order to do that they have you know uh, locations uh, and mm -hmm. computers uh, and the spaces uh, and room available and so yeah it's really nice and, and also i saw that some very smart people have been coming out of those schools so if you live in those uh, towns or cities and you manage to attend those uh, classes uh, you're probably a very lucky person uh, in Russia, in Russia, we have this uh, format of um, how is it called, like hack spaces. So mm -hmm. it's it's somewhat similar. It's just 
uh, it's not really like a school, but it's a place where a lot of people you can uh, also like uh, read lectures there or listen to lectures uh, or some master classes. But also they have uh, so you can kind of rent rent a workplace there, mm -hmm. uh, and you can oh, actually right. choose where to sit, and then you can join some team. Like where there are always some guys there with like three D printers. I guess they are doing some tinkering with uh, electronic uh, electronic yeah. stuff and it's pretty pretty interesting yeah so it's a mixture between the co-working and we do have uh, uh, some hacker spaces here in italy where they use uh, this kind of hardware devices like arduino maybe or uh, 3d printers uh, stuff like that mm -hmm. and they experiment uh, that's interesting because you get to play with stuff you don't usually work with like for example me, myself, I'm a developer, software developer. I don't know anything about uh, hardware. I never played with hardware. So for me, it would be super cool to uh, team with somebody who's experienced with, uh, I don't know, uh, electronic circuits and stuff like that, and hack with some uh, Arduino, uh, uh, learn something new every day. I, I find that the learning is key. Whatever uh, you do, is uh, not I think really you, you guys. You guys created Arduino, right? It was created in Italy. Yeah, yeah, it was an Italian guy, yeah, yeah. It's One actually a friend popular. of mine. Yeah, yeah, he's actually a friend of mine. <laughs> Very smart guy. Back so in it's the day. One, of the, one of the most uh, portable, uh, uh, like, controllers in the world, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, very, very successful. Hugely I, successful. I actually have one right here. It's ah, <laughs> Arduino Mega. <laughs> so you know something about Arduino, so not like me. <laughs> no, I just bought it to, to learn, basically. So ah, okay. And uh, I, I believe uh, last time uh, we, when we actually had an in-person conference, uh, there was a talk about uh, MicroPython. So some guys, mm -hmm. uh, there is like a separate version of Python that can actually run on microcontrollers uh, and uh, even, even on Arduino. And okay. uh, it's also widely used with... Uh, whether used by people who want, you know, to do some school projects and uh, like to, to teach kids how, how to deal with hardware, it's pretty nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, still, it's still sometimes a pain to read, you know, the sheets of like where, which, which wires to connect where, but I mean, it's, it's really, really amazing. Yeah. Okay, so, I don't know, yeah, nobody's, no, looks like everybody's calmly sitting there so i guess yeah let's let's not it's it's really it's really amazing talking to you thanks thanks a lot for for your talk and for for this discussion uh let, i guess let's switch to to discord for now uh and okay. uh yeah and so hope to see you in person someday when all this okay will be hopefully over. hopefully so yeah hopefully we i will be in maybe i will be in moscow in september when you have a, your in-person conference if you manage mm -hmm. uh, i would be super happy to be there it was a pleasure thank you so much for having me and see you soon thank you thank you very bye. much see you in moscow bye goodbye goodbye bye, -bye.